we're going to talk about Bonhoeffer here today. Bonhoeffer, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is perhaps the most um, influential theologian of the 20th century. He um, is a German, or was a German. He was born uh, in a contemporary time of World War II. Uh, he was ordained to the ministry um, about a year before Hitler came to power. And so um, he lived through that time. And he was an interesting man in that he had um, a lot of uh, ideas that seemed radical at the time. You'll be amazed as I talk about some of this stuff. It's just stuff that we readily accept uh, nowadays. And um, he also uh, stood up to Hitler. He's one of the few pastors to do that in Germany. Um, ultimately, he was, he was martyred for his faith. Uh, he was um, uh, arrested uh, initially because he was preaching the gospel, and they had made that against the law uh, in the latter part of the war. And uh, they arrested him for that, but then they found out um, he, he was on a periphery involved with the July 20th plot to assassinate Hitler. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on so you can understand why a pastor would be involved in that. Um, and they, they discovered his name on one of the list of participants. He was already in jail. And when they discovered that, Hitler uh, just, he had a list. And he said, I want every one of these people executed. And so uh, he was hung three weeks before, uh, before Hitler committed suicide. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of one of these things where you hear that and you think, Oh man, another three weeks and he could have lived and gone on and done things. But uh, I've always looked at it, it's sort of like in the book of Ruth, you know, where you say, for such a time as this, that for such a time as this, he was brought to Germany and, and he spoke up at that time. Um, and then, um, you know, God, God called him home at that point. Uh, he wrote a, a number of books, but his most famous book was called The Cost of Discipleship. And... Um, it has been read. I don't think I've met a pastor who hasn't read it, you know, who hasn't said, uh, you know, this really influenced me a lot when I was younger. And uh, with the cost of discipleship, he talked about, started talking about cheap grace. Um, and by cheap grace, he meant that the gospel had become watered down. Now, this is 1937 when he was writing this. And he, he said that the church had watered it down. You know, Southern Baptists have a, a saying where they say, love the sinner, but hate the sin. Uh, well, he saw cheap grace as meaning that uh, we love the sinner, but we let him go ahead and keep on sinning. You know, that that's, and so that's what grace became. Uh, whereas in reality, grace is very costly. It's, it's free to accept grace, but in the end, it's going to ultimately cost you everything. Um, and I'll explain some of that you know, as I go, go along. The, the primary thing... Um, and bon, in Bonhoeffer's theology, is, uh, he's, he's very, what theologians would call Christocentric. Uh, Christ is central. Uh, it's Christ and Christ alone. Uh, he talks about the fact that uh, Jesus is central. Jesus is God's word, and we're to interact and submit to God's word. And, and he, he uses it uh, very interchangeable in his writings. In other words, uh, what does the word say? Um, how are you going to submit to the word? But when he says, what does the word say? He's, he's talking about um, Jesus and the word of God because the word of God is dynamic and the word of God is really the mind of God set down or at least part of the mind of God set down. And, uh, and so in that sense, it does reflect Jesus and, and God. And so, um, you know, he, he talks of it that way and he says in a conflict of loyalties, Jesus should always win. Uh, so no matter what you're faced with, if you have to make a choice, Jesus will always win. If, uh, you know, um, I, I had a woman a year or two ago who was talking to me about what, again, Southern Baptists might call missionary dating. She was dating somebody who was not a believer, and she had this idea that, you know, if I marry him, you know, eventually I'll be witnessing to him and he'll become, he'll become a believer. Um, and that would be an example of where Jesus needs to be central. Uh, because even if she was in love with the young man, uh, her loyalty should go to Jesus. And, uh, and, you know, Jesus wouldn't, Jesus teaches that we, we shouldn't uh, marry people who are, or Paul teaches that we shouldn't marry someone who's not a Christian. Um, when he talks about grace, cheap grace, it's grace without discipleship and uh, without obedience. Um, it's a culture of Christianity where, you know, well, I'm a Christian and, and everything, and yeah, grace is free. Uh, but then there's no change in their lifestyle. Um, grace can never be separated from discipleship. 
And uh, Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran. Uh, and so he very much was in the tradition of, of Martin Luther, which is, of course, the Reformation. But Martin Luther, when he was writing and he talked about grace, he never even had the concept that someone would try to separate grace from discipleship. And so part of what Bonhoeffer was saying is we have to get back to this, that they are interlinked when it comes to it. In fact, um, Jesus Christ, or discipleship without Jesus is no, is no discipleship at all. Um, that, that's what he said. Uh, but as far as grace goes, so, so does it mean that, um, you know, you, uh, that the law doesn't apply because Jesus came and fulfilled the law. And so the, he has fulfilled the law, and so then we step into his grace. And um, I, I like the verse, John 1, 14. In fact, a lot of times when I'm, I'm signing books, I'll put that down. And it says, uh, um, Jesus came to live with us for a while. He came from God, I'm paraphrasing, full of grace and truth. Mm -hmm. So he had grace, but he also had truth. He, he would speak the truth, which is the law, that this is wrong, <laughs> or uh, that God has set this up so that uh, you're going to fail at this kind of thing. Um, and some examples of how we really should react uh, are uh, the woman caught in adultery. You know, Jesus looks around and, and he's writing on the ground and he, he, uh, he stands up and he looks and he says, okay, uh, if you're the one who is without sin, cast the first stone. And of course all these guys start dropping the stones and they start walking away until only <coughs> the woman left. And he, he looks... At her and she said, and he says, uh, "Does no one condemn you?" Uh, and she says, "No." And he says, uh, "Well, then I don't condemn you either. Um, go and stop sinning." Again, I'm paraphrasing. Or go and change your life. Okay. So, what he's showing, he's exhibiting grace. Well, I don't, con I, I don't condemn you. Now go ahead and go. But he doesn't say go and keep living your life like it has been. The truth that he speaks is, go and change your life now. That's right. Okay. Uh, the, the other one would be, you know, the woman who he met at the well. He, he had uh, a, uh, you know, a Holy Spirit knowledge uh, of this woman and the, and the things that she had done in her life and that she had several husbands, that she was living with someone who was not her husband. And yet you never get the sense from him that he is talking down to her, that he is rebuking her or, or anything like that. Uh, he treats her much nicer than the disciples who are shocked to see him talking to a Samaritan woman. Um, and so, uh, but he does talk to her about a lifestyle change. He talks about the spirit of God that will, that will work, work through you. Um, and so she goes off and she tells the village, come and meet a man who's told me all about myself. And here she is bringing people to Jesus. Now, you know, had Jesus rebuked her, you know, and said, you know, turn or burn, I doubt that she would have gone to the village. But she experienced God's grace and so then, uh, she brought them back. I, I think um, a couple of analogies, because it's really hard to understand what grace is when you get into it, is, um, well, how is grace free, but then it cost you everything? Um, if you were going through the desert, and you came upon a caravan, and the caravan uh, leader says, okay, you can join us, and we'll take you on out of the desert and the wilderness. You can be part of our community. You can be part of... The caravan will feed you, will give you water, will protect you if somebody comes. Um, but if you're going to be part of our caravan, you have to live the way that we live. You have to follow my rules. Now that makes perfect sense to us. But that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Okay, I will give you the grace. I will let you step into this caravan um, you know, of grace. Another example would be an orchestra. If you imagine a, a young woman who is really gifted at playing the cello. And so what she does is she, um, she joins this orchestra, and the maestro, the master, comes in, and he begins to work her. He begins to insist that she play a little bit better. Uh, he begins to make her practice, and eventually she changes the point where he's not even having to push her because she is pushing herself, and he brings her greatest potential out. That's what grace is. We step into God's grace. We join the orchestra. And then God begins to work in us and through us to begin to bring out the best in us and also to bring out the best in those around us as we're, um, you know, as we're walking in grace and in love. Um, one of the things Bonhoeffer said is cheap grace is uh, preaching. This is a 
quote of his very famous one is, Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. Now, uh, so cheap grace is, um, is a denial of the incarnation, really, because what you're saying is that that was not necessary. And, 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 and you know, some questions I would ask, you know, that you can ponder as you look at this and, and uh, where Bonhoeffer was trying to go, which is leading towards, it's about a personal relationship with Jesus. It's not about rules. It's not about uh, um, regulations. Uh, you know, it's not about just being a member of the church. But if the incarnation is, uh, is personal, you know, do you think that Jesus died so we could follow a doctrine? Um, uh, did he suffer a cruel and bloody crucifixion to give us a code of conduct? Um, did he give up all he had, take on the nature of a servant, and uh, walk through Palestine as a human being so that we could give intellectual assent uh, to our belief in Jesus? Uh, that doesn't fit in with a, with a personal incarnation whatsoever. Um, what... Uh, you know, one of the things he, he talks about, what Chief Grace does, is it actually opens the door to legalism also. Because legalism is really, uh, even though it's the opposite of what we would think of as somebody who is engaged in, you know, not living a lifestyle, so they've slipped over to this style, or to this place in their Christian walk. Um, legalism is, you still are denying uh, the incarnation, you're denying the fullness of the sacrifice of Jesus, because you're relying on rules to set up what should be done. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing about rules. You can have a list of 50 rules, and you can check them off and say that you're doing them, but ultimately there's another set of 50 rules that you're not doing. And that's really part of what Jesus is trying to teach us uh, as, as he walks through the New Testament. He's trying to say, you're not ever going to do it. In fact, God set it up this way. Here's the law. There's absolutely no way you're going to get up here, and that's why you need the grace of God, that's why you need me, that's why you need uh, my sacrifice on the cross. In fact, he goes on, he tells his disciples, you know, if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven on your own, your righteousness will have to exceed that of the Pharisees. Now, you know, we like to put the Pharisees down, look in 2020 hindsight, you know, these are the bad guys, you know, <coughs> everything. The reality is, these were very, very religious men who were very, very good uh, at, at um, being holy, okay? Certainly, they, we, you know, we see in the New Testament that there were some who uh, were corrupted, but these, these men were really trying to check off the list as much as they could. And, and in fact, they got into rules, you know? I mean, uh, you keep the Sabbath, you know? But then they start dividing in, well, exactly what does that mean? And, you know, they'd have sub-rules below the rules. Um, that's why Jesus says, you know, you... Uh, you find a convert and then you make him more of a son of hell than you are. Because you, you bring him towards God's grace and then you tell him to follow all of these rules that are here. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, um, I'm sorry, lost my place in my notes here. But uh, what Jesus is trying to do then is, as he's walking us through grace, and this is uh, Bonhoeffer, this is my own analogy, but this is what he sort of is teaching. We come to Jesus, and as we're walking towards the kingdom of heaven, we're dropping away the things that are no longer essential, the things that entangles, <laughs> the things that slow us down. And, and, and so Jesus is constantly going to bring us to a choice. Are you going to get rid of that? Why are you carrying that weight? Just put it down. You know, you've got a backpack, and it's full of things, and he says, why have you got that in the backpack? <clears throat> put it down. And eventually you get to that narrow gate, going into the kingdom of heaven, and you see that you can't eat, the backpack's empty by then, but you can't even make it through there wearing the backpack empty. So you have to drop the backpack, and you go through that narrow gate. And when you get through that narrow gate, then you realize all the stuff that you had been dropping didn't mean a thing, or at least didn't mean a thing in the kingdom of heaven. You were trying to carry it into the kingdom of heaven when you would have found out that it was something that you could you didn't need, you would have tossed it away anyway. Jesus is just trying to bring you to that. Um, one of the things that Bonhoeffer talks about is faithful obedience or obedient trust. 
He uses a German word for this, and there is no direct translation into English for it. And so I tend to use that. It's, it's faithful obedience uh, or obedient trust. And it means that you are obedient to Jesus. Um, and you do that in faith. And, and it, this kind of sounds like it's cyclical, but it really it, it, it is in a way. Um, but it's not a catch-22 type of cycle. In order to be obedient, you have to have faith. But in order to have faith, you have to have obedience. Now, what does that mean? Uh, let's consider Peter when he steps out on the water. All right? He steps out on the water. You know, he yells to Jesus. He says, if you will tell me to come, I will come. Jesus says, well, come on. And um, he steps out of the boat. And this is obedience. It's obedience. And can you imagine when his foot hit the water and it didn't go down? All right? Now his, his faith has been confirmed, and, his, and so now he takes another step. But it's easier for him to be obedient because he's already seen what happened there. So he has greater faith, so he takes another step, and in the obedience of that faith, uh, faithful step, he now has more experience to show him that this is, this is going to work. And so then it just moves on from there. Every step teaches him uh, greater faith that you can rely on the promises of Jesus, but every step also shows him that obedience to Jesus uh, is, is how you're going to walk through faith and walk to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and it's also a great analogy because, of course, what he did is, you know, then he started getting worried because he started looking around at the waves and everything like that. And, um, and then he began to sink. Um, so uh, he talks about um, this faithful obedience. Um, so steps of faith have to be concrete. The belief in Jesus has to be concrete. You can't just say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. There has to be concrete steps of faith. Okay? Uh, you know, a preacher, you know, might preach it that, you know, you have to take this step, you know, and then God will show you where the next step is. But there have to be these concrete steps. Jesus is constantly driving us to make choices. And the choice comes down to this. Are you with me or are you not with me? We make that choice every single day. Are you with me or are you not with me? The rich young ruler uh, comes along and, he, and what he's trying to do is he's trying to get to heaven on his own terms. You know, I've kept all of these commandments since I was a boy. What else must I do? See, he's trying to develop a list. I've gotten, I've gotten everything. I've checked it off. What else do I need to check off? All right? And Jesus isn't going to have any of that. So, so Jesus, uh, you know, Jesus says, well, I'll tell you what. Give away everything you have and come with me. And the young man, the Bible says he walked away sad. Jesus brought him to a choice. All right? Jesus understood that that was what held his heart. And so Jesus wouldn't share loyalty with that. And he's telling him, uh, you know, do this. Um, and that became a test of his obedience. Uh, that's why, you know, when people talk about this analogy, he may not ask you to give away all your money. He may ask you to give away something else. But, uh, but the rich young man uh, was not going to be able to get to heaven on his own terms. He had to believe that Jesus was who he was, who he said he was, and that his promises were good. Uh, he had to take a step of faith that was concrete and real, that was tangible. And you can imagine, if he had taken that step and found out Jesus was true to everything he said, he'd have never had a regret about giving away that money. But if he'd have taken that step and found out that Jesus was just a charlatan, he could, it would have been irrevocable. He couldn't go back to goodwill and ask him for the million dollars back. You know? I mean, he'd given it all away. And so now his life has been radically changed, but he doesn't have Jesus. But Jesus is saying, you make a choice. You know? can, can you follow me or, or can you not follow me? Um, you know, when he called Levi, there was a choice. Levi could make a choice. He, he, could, uh, he could obey Jesus or he couldn't. You know, Jesus says, follow me. It's a command. In fact, it's a very emphatic command. So he has a choice now. He can say, um, you know, no, I won't follow you, or I will follow you, but he cannot ignore that. See, and that's where Jesus brings us. And, and this is what Bonhoeffer teaches, is that we're, we're forced towards this, uh, this choice that we're supposed to, to make. 
And, and God brings us, or Jesus brings us to this point where he's moving us from what we see as certainty to uncertainty, um, or safety to unsafety. But in reality, in you know, one of those paradoxes of Christian faith, it's the other way around. We think it's secure, but it's not. The security is with Jesus, you know. We, we think the stability and the certainty is over here, but it's not. Um, it's here with Jesus. Bonhoeffer lived in a time, you know, in, in uh, 1933, the Germans came in or the Nazis came in, uh, and they began to take away civil rights. Uh, they began uh, uh, dictating even what the church could do. They, uh, they wanted to put a swastika in, so you'd have the cross here, and you would have a swastika here. Um, and the, the German church was compromising. Now, keep in mind, it was a state church. But Bonhoeffer then split off, and he, called, he created with some other gentlemen what he called the Confessing Church. And the Confessing Church was it was independent of the state. Uh, it would be churches that would be like in a storefront, you know. And, um, and, uh, and they, would, they would live on faith and work on faith, and, and they would build a congregation that way. And so, um, so Bonhoeffer was doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so he's seeing all these changes, but all these institutions that were so secure, the church, the government is suddenly radically different. Uh, your rights are suddenly radically different. Um, you know, they're taking away Jews. Uh, they have this war going on that is destroying uh, the middle class. One thing that Hitler did was he, he revived the German economy when it was, it was in, you know, a worse state than, like, our depression. But he revived the economy. But, um, you know, it, that didn't mean that there was security there. And, and I was really struck when I started uh, writing uh, the book Costly Grace, looking at Bonhoeffer stuff. Uh, and this was just about the time that we entered, you know, what, whatever you want to call it, the, the recession you know, and all of those things. And, um, uh, you know, and I sat there and I thought, boy, we are in a time, I'm not saying this is, this is like, uh, you know, a warlike thing or like Nazi Germany or anything, but we are in a time where stability is completely being undermined, at least the things that we think are stable. Our 401ks, you know, are dwindling, you know. Uh, the value of our houses are dwindling. Uh, people are getting laid off. Um, and, all, and all of these things are happening, and they were things that we rely on. You know, we rely on the government to do certain things. We rely on the fact that if we bought a house, it was going to increase in value over the years. Um, you know, we rely on the fact that if we're putting money aside, we're going to have this 401k, and we can then, uh, you know, retire. Um, and, and here they're all gone. Um, and uh, in fact. Uh, you know, not to get into details or anything, but I, I, was, I was laid off twice uh, in uh, 2007 and then 2008. And, and the second one was I was, I was uh, doing work for Reader's Digest. Now, can you think of anything more stable in America than Reader's Digest? Safety, you know, stability, okay? Well, in October of 2009, they declared bankruptcy. Okay, and I was out of a job. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, this is, this is what is going on. And so Bonhoeffer's looking at this stuff, and that's part of what he's saying. Jesus, you have to have your loyalty with Jesus, because all of these other things are going to be swept away. Mm -hmm. They can be swept away. And, in fact, the positive thing that we can take from what has happened with the economy and everything is it hopefully has given us a chance to focus on what is important and what isn't important. Mm -hmm. And where we need to invest our time. I tell you, one of the radical things that, uh, I shouldn't say radical, but one of the things that I have made, uh, I'm very focused on these days, is, is being with my sons and focusing on my sons. Because, because they are a true treasure. You know, I can get another job. You know, I can get another house. Uh, I, I can't get other sons. You know? Right, Nathan? Okay. You can give me five dollars for saying that. But, uh, so, so um, you know, so Jesus is is bringing us. He's pushing us, and this is what Bonhoeffer says. He's constantly pushing us to what I, I call moving from fallen thinking um, to kingdom thinking. 
mm. where we're beginning to see that the security is in Jesus. Let me ask you a question. You know, the uh, the disciples were on a boat one day, and, and a storm came up, and and they were being storm tossed, and they were just frightened. And they looked out, and they saw what they thought might be a ghost walking along, and uh, and and it was you know Jesus. Um, and take that picture, put it in your mind. Where's the safest place to be in that picture? Our instincts would say, get in the boat. But the safest place to be is to be standing next to Jesus, <laughs> clinging to Jesus. You know? that's, that's the safest place for you to be. Um, so, so uh, you know, I, I mentioned uh, Levi. He called Levi. There's even in that command where, where he says, um, uh, follow me, uh, th there's a sense, it's, it's wrapped up uh, in the sense that it's an exclusive path uh, that is becoming and will go on forever. And so that command is wrapped up in that. So he's saying, follow me, you know, we're in the process of becoming and we will go on forever. And, and you know, um, I, I, and there's also the element of this is the one way to go. All right? So this is just a rough paraphrase, but in English, you know, we, we might say it's something like this. Uh, I am the way, and I am calling you into the unique and unending union with me, the, the one and only way. But there's the element of, uh, of this path. So quite literally, he is saying, um, come and be part of the road, and I'm the road. Come and be part of the road. Um, so uh, Jesus calls us to this comprehensive and absolute change, you know, in our walk and in our, our, our life. Um, okay, suffering. Now, Bonhoeffer's theology is rooted deeply in suffering. And, and I really, I think what he says is, is absolutely right. Um, now, to backtrack uh, on, on his bio, when he, um, when he graduated from seminary, he was too young to be ordained because uh, they, they had a, a rule in Germany you had to be like 25 to be ordained, and he was still too young to do that. So he came to America, he, uh, he studied and taught at Union, the uh, Union Seminary up in New York, and, uh, and he got involved. There, there was a man that he met, and he got involved um, uh, with... Uh, well, a black church, what we would call an African-American church these days. And, and he went there, and it, it made a radical transformation on him. He saw people who really believed the gospel, whereas he had grown up seeing it, there were intellectual discussions. But he saw it, and, and he said, you know, it, this experience took, took my theology and turned it into a practical lifestyle uh, and all. And um, the, the church that he was at... Um, was uh, and the pastor who was there, he's the one who coined cheap grace. And he later mentored uh, another young African American pastor uh, named Martin Luther King. And so, and so the, the whole civil rights movement <laughs> kind of was birthed in that church. And Bonhoeffer was watching its birth. And, and he was watching the way that uh, African Americans were treated in America. Uh, he was watching these things, and it really changed the way that he was seeing things. He began to think, you know, we, we need to, uh, he said it this way, God is a God who bears. God is a God who bears. Bears our burdens. And therefore, if we want to be Christ-like, we need to bear one another's burdens. We need to look out for those who are disaffected. We need to look out for those who have no voice. We need to speak out for these people. Um, that is a lot of what being a Christian filled with the Holy Spirit is about. Um, and um, when, when he speaks about that bearing, he's not only talking about, okay, we're going to have a prayer, you know, for Brother Phil, and, uh, and we're going to listen to him in, in small group and, 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 you know, and empathize with him. <coughs> He's talking about the fact that you would enter that person's life. That, you know, if, if he's struggling financially, you might actually sacrifice to give him uh, some money to pay his bills. Uh, you know, you might, uh, you might actually, uh, you know, if it's a, a young single mother, you know, you, you might offer to watch your kids. In other words, you sacrifice <coughs> for that other person because that's exactly what Jesus did. And you do that sacrifice 
whether those people are going to respond to you or not, whether those people are going to love you or appreciate you or anything else. And you do that because even as we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, and so that's, that's what we're to do. Um, this bearing, uh, Bonhoeffer says, is precisely what uh, being a Christian is about. It's exactly what it means to be a Christian. Now, the suffering, and it's interesting, he ties in suffering and, um, and rejection. That, that to be Christ-like, we have to not only suffer, but we have to be rejected. And, and I thought when I was reading through some of his stuff that, you know, I, I wondered if one of the reasons we have uh, spiritual immaturity uh, in America is because we're afraid of rejection. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yet uh, Jesus says that the path, you know, is to go through these things. And Bonhoeffer is saying explicitly, you know, the path to maturity is rejection. The path to maturity is the suffering, because the suffering drives you straight into the heart of God. Uh, Bonhoeffer is an interesting way to look at it. You know, Jesus, when he was in the garden, he prayed, let this cup pass. God answered his prayer. The cup did pass. Um, it was because, because the suffering and the pain that he was feeling was only temporary. He went, you know, he was crucified, and then he was resurrected, and all that pain and suffering was gone. All right? I, I, you gave me kind of thing. I'm not saying that, you know, there was a theological thing, that, you know, he didn't do the work of the cross. I'm saying that he was praying. I, I mean, he was so overwhelmed, he was sweating tears. And yet, just a few days later, he was resurrected in heaven. So God had answered his prayer. And so, what we can do when we look at suffering, we can look at it that this is a temporary thing. That this is something that is actually driving us into the heart of God. And, and we can begin to see, um, Bonhoeffer would say, uh, the, cry, the cross was not a tragedy. Uh, the cross was actually uh, the crowning glory of Jesus Christ. And so the same thing uh, can be with us as we begin to, we begin to bear the sins of others um, you know, and help them. Um, he talked a great deal, uh, talks a great deal about uh, compassion. Um, and, uh, you know, I've mentioned that where, where you speak up uh, for the downtrodden and uh, you speak with an authenticity. You speak the truth. Uh, and this is what got him in trouble a lot. Um, uh, right after Hitler came to power, um, it just happened that Bonhoeffer uh, was supposed to give a sermon on national radio. And he gave this sermon on national radio. And part of what he said is, is we are in danger of idolatry. We are in danger of turning the Fuhrer into a being, you know, an adulterous being where we, we look at him. And, and he began to speak along those lines and, uh, and suddenly the broadcast went dead. Um, you know, they cut the lines and wouldn't let him finish the sermon. But he spoke the truth um, as, as he did that. And um, when World War II broke out, uh, he had some friends who got him back to New York. And they had a position for him uh, at Union Seminary. He could have sat the war out in New York and been perfectly safe. And, and he got there, and then almost immediately when he got there, he began to think, um, this was a mistake. I, I, I misheard God. And, uh, and he got on a boat, which was uh, like one of the last boats that was a direct line from New York into Germany. He got on a boat, he went back to Germany. And he, uh, um, he began preaching in an underground seminary. Uh, he began uh, sharing the gospel. Uh, you had to be in the military or in some sort of government service, or at least it was against the law not to be. He actually got into uh, uh, one form of uh, Germany's secret service. And, uh, and what that did is it gave him the freedom to travel. And in traveling, he, uh, he would preach the gospel and he would speak. Uh, but what he also was doing, it, it became known, this, this particular thing, a lot of people like Bonhoeffer were coming, and they were actually using this uh, secret service uh, to smuggle Jews out of the country. Um, but there again, he was risking his life. Uh, and and, and what, what he would say about it is, you know, we have to make a choice. We die every day. We have to make a choice every day uh, about what it is. And... and um, you know, and this is what I'm called to, regardless of what it may cost me. Um, I really like Bonhoeffer because he has what I would call a, a messy theology. 
And, and by that, you know, you look at some things and it seems like, well, there's some inconsistency here. But I don't think that it's inconsistency. I think what it is is a man who is truly growing and moving closer to Christ. And, and he was here at one point, and then he moved over <coughs> here, and it appears to be uh, a contradiction, you know, but it isn't. Um, you know, part of that would be he was actually personally a pacifist. Uh, that's why he didn't want to be in the army. Um, he was a pacifist. He would be a pacifist along the lines of uh, like a, a Gandhi. You know, in other words, um, you know, you can come, you can strike me, you can beat me down. I'm not going to strike back. He believed that what you would do is if you would let evil, if instead of, instead of uh, coming against evil on an individual level, where often, and you guys know this, you know, you, you, you know, you're being wrong, but a little bit of self-righteousness slips in. And the evil then reacts to your self-righteousness. He said the thing to do is to let the evil come. Trust God. Trust Jesus. And let the evil sweep over you. Because what that does is it puts the evil face to face with Jesus. And then Jesus um, will have to, uh, Jesus will deal with it at that point. So here's a man who is, a, who is an avowed pacifist, and yet he gets involved with uh, the plot to kill Hitler. Um, and it started off uh, where people were just sort of seeking his advice, in other words, coming to him and saying, you know, will, will I be condemned by God forever if, if I'm involved in this? And, and then he slowly became involved. He wasn't right in the planning of it all, but, but he did get involved. He did make a... Um, a trip to England, a secret trip to England, where what he was trying to do was he was saying, if this assassination takes place, uh, will you allow us to, to uh, you know, have peace with you at that point and to come up with some kind of peace? But that was late in the war, and at that point, uh, the English and, frankly, the Americans, too, they weren't interested in a compromise peace. You know, we wanted to have unconditional surrender. And so they, uh, they showed no interest in, in him. And... Um, he went back, and, and this is how he would describe why, on a, why he would move from this. On a personal level, he would remain a pacifist. But when you are dealing with the fact that the government itself is evil, you need to stand up and do something. And he used this analogy. He said, if you were standing on the street corner and a drunk driver came down the street, bumped up on the sidewalk, ran over a couple of people and killed them, and kept weaving down the street, you would have the obligation to do everything in your power to stop that drunk driver. And so that is why if, if the government is evil, e evil and you cannot petition the government, then at that point you have to look at these other means. But he also said, you know, I'm not certain of how this is, but if, if this is a sin, I'm going to fall upon the grace of God. Because God, you know, will forgive in this. And he wasn't just saying that, you know, like, I'm going to do this and hope God forgives me or anything in, in a flippant sense. He was saying very seriously, I'm not sure about this, but I'm going to trust in God. I, I know that God will forgive me, you know, as I, as I move forward on it. And, and, and so, you know, one of the things as far as getting involved in the public marketplace, um, he, uh, he would encourage people to do that. But... But that doesn't mean that you legislate morality. It doesn't mean that you control the government. Now, he's not saying you can't run for a government position, you know, if you want to or, or anything like that. But he is saying that what you do is you need to become involved and you need to, you need to speak up. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'll give you an example. For instance, uh, you know, I, I'm against uh, abortion. Um, you know, there are people who pick it, there are people who uh, work within the law trying to do all kinds of things. So, you know, they're shaped to do it that way. Um, I was always involved in crisis pregnancy centers. You know, that was my way of, of, of facing that evil and trying to help that evil at that point. Um, so there are various ways that you can, you can step into these things. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll say, and, and um, you can ponder upon this, if the church was being the church, we wouldn't have a, uh, a health insurance crisis in America. Um, you know, if, if the church had been, was being the church, uh, we might not have had quite the mortgage crisis that we had in America, whether it be the ethics involved in it, or whether it be people 
um, of greater means helping people of lesser means. And I'm not talking about the government being involved in that. I'm talking about it being, you know, a Christian involvement at that point. Um, you know, uh, the divorce industry is a billion dollar divorce industry. And um, it is not, you know, you can get the impression that you, know, you have objective lawyers who get together and you do all these things. It's not like that at all. Okay? But, you know, part of the reason for that, Christians have largely abandoned that. It's like when Christians, uh, you know, abandoned Hollywood and just said, we'll have nothing to do with it, and films became what they became. Um, we have never really stepped in. We have stuff to try and counsel people not to divorce. We have things to uh, help people pick up the pieces after a divorce. But what's there in the middle to help people as they're, as they're going through? Or, or insisting that laws be changed, insisting that, that things be done, you know, in different ways. Is there anyone here who's a funeral director? All right, so I'm safe to say this. You know, the church could, you know, could be involved in that. I, I will tell you, as a pastor, I have grieved over the way funeral directors do things. You know, you, you've got something. I remember when I took my mother in, and she, uh, my father had died. And they're trying to talk her up, you know, into a $15,000 casket. It has the Last Supper carved on the inside. You know, it's like, Mom, he's dead. He's not going to see it. You know? uh, and, and these things just go, you know, right on and become more and more expensive. Um, uh, nursing homes. Looking out for the elderly, what can we do about that kind of thing? And stepping forward, nursing homes, you know, cost two or three thousand dollars a month. Um, you know, there's a there's a ministry there. Anyway, um, I've, uh, I, uh, you know, I've just touched briefly on on some of his teachings and everything. Um, but I wanted to have an opportunity or give you an opportunity if you wanted to ask some questions. Uh, my big question is is um, what can you do in the church we're in? to try to step up, because I think the church is pretty much laid down, whatever. They, they, don't, they don't have a real strong mission. They don't really have anything to draw people in anymore. They don't have anything that's, our kids are just falling away because there's not anything real there. Right. I mean, and, that, and I think that's probably what he saw in Germany, was there wasn't anything real, nothing there to make people stand up. Right, because it really was. In fact, he, he became he began to talk about uh, um, you know this culture of religion that was there, and, and he's been very misunderstood. And that he, he talked about a Christless Christianity, and and uh, you know some people take that to mean well he doesn't believe in Christ, and, and and that's not at all if you read his books. What he's talking about is is a Christianity that completely rejects Christ, but still calls itself Christianity. Um, and I think it's prevalent today in our in our country, and I think that's why yeah. we're in the mess where I mean, you're talking about you know divorce rate and everything. We wouldn't have this problem with welfare if the church wouldn't have just given up their whole thing of taking care of the poor. Right and now, we have people that are just that are they're using both church avenues and the government to get stuff. Right, and, and that's part of what I mean is when I say that if the church were being the church, we wouldn't have some of these issues because. You know, with the, with the sense of the poor, if if uh, if we were doing a good job there, then the government would have less reason to get involved mm. at, at that point. It, you had raised your hand back then. Oh, um, yes. Did he have a family, and did they openly identify with him, and, and how, how old was he when he died? He was 39 when he died. Uh, he is. Uh, he was hung. He was. Uh, said to die very bravely. He was actually praying with the other prisoners and, and uh, you know, giving them communion and doing things like that. Uh, he, uh, he walked to the gallows on his own, you know, and, uh, just, uh, and, and he, he, said, uh, he said as he was stepping up on the gallows, he said, this is the end, but for me it's a beginning. Um, he, uh, yeah, his, his family, they were, uh, you would, uh, they were like, upper class or upper middle class. His father was a psychiatrist. He taught at a university. Uh, a number of uh, his brothers and uncles were, were those kinds of people. They'd been very involved in the government, um, but they were, uh, they, they, um, you know, they were against Nazism, uh, you know, and, and what had come in, the totalitarian socialistic state 
that had come along. Uh, their oldest son, his oldest brother, died in World War I. But in World War II, uh, um, uh, I may have this wrong, but the, the two sons, uh, Dietrich and his brother, and the two uh, brother-in-laws so that the daughters had married, uh, two of them were killed and two of them were imprisoned. So the family paid a great price for it. Now, he, um, there's a great book uh, written by Eric Metaxas that's called Bonhoeffer, and it's just, it, it's a wonderful book if you want to learn more about him. And, and yeah, but it, it, it's hard to believe this in this day and age, but he, he met this young woman uh, just before he was imprisoned, and, and they, uh, you know, they, they weren't really dating. It was like, a, you know, they did things with escorts and chaperones and all, but, but um, they fell in love, and he, they were going to be married, and then he was in prison. And um, so they never did get married, and he hardly ever saw her. But it was this incredible romance. I mean, you know, I just told you all about this serious guy, but if you read his love letters to this woman, I mean, they just, they just drip with romance. I mean, it's hard to believe you're reading the same guy. He's just, he's just in love with this woman, and, and you know, um, you know. Christians make like better love. There you go. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Are, are any other questions or comments? Just out of curiosity, I mean, just to, was his, his view of, like, you, you talk about all of these social uh, things helping uh, the, the poor in nursing homes, et cetera. Uh, was he in favor of just sort of taking over those kinds of welfare programs or whatever that you want to label them? Did he also, at the same time, engage in trying to help those folks improve through their faith in Christ and through, you know, prospering, hopefully, rather than just being on the dole? Uh, is my right. He, um, you know, he, he did not set up any kind of institutional thing, uh, you know, or anything like that. He he was teaching people to engage. Uh, like I said, he was involved in uh, getting Jews out of the country. Uh, he he set up the one formal thing. He he set up a, an underground seminary so that he could teach pastors uh, or people to be pastors. That was ultimately shut down. Obviously, he was more involved in making disciples right. than he was because I, you know, clearly, you know, Life of Christ, Bonhoeffer, any of these, these guys like that, it's, it's about making disciples. I mean, and I think we're talking about the lady down here talking about the church being in such disarray. I frankly believe where we've really failed You've got cheap grace. I don't know what kind of one you're going to do. I know what we haven't done is we have not made the kind of disciples that Bonhoeffer describes in his books. They just are almost non existent uh, across the board in the church. And it's in pastors, it's true. They're not disciples, and they don't know how to make disciples. And I struggle with are they really Christians? Because I think the inference is Bonhoeffer would say if you're not really a disciple, you're probably not really a Christian. And that's where I, you know, I struggle with that. I think people can be saved, but they can be like spiritual infants. And if no one is there to develop them, then clearly they're going to stay spiritual, spiritual infants. they got problems. Right. No he, yeah, he, he has a really interesting passage where he talks about, you know, he's talking about um, you, you have to look at, you know, like Christian community and, you know, if the, if the community itself is Christian and, and moving on, and then he's talking, the, the passage that I found interesting was, he's describing being in a worship service. And he says, you don't even know there. You don't even know if the person sitting next to you is a true disciple of Christ, because the outward appearance can make it seem so. But what he does is he twists that, and he says, what about you? You know, do, do you know? And uh, I, I agree with you absolutely. Um, if, if we were creating disciples, in fact, you've done it more articulately than, than I was saying. If we were creating disciples, then, then a lot of the things that we try to change would be changing because the people would be doing it out of a natural outflow of their relationship with Absolutely. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. you, would have to, you would even probably have to organize it that much. It would just be kind of like it was in Acts 2. Yeah. Uh, they just simply did it because it needed to be done. You know, when they saw the need, they met the need. But uh, we've got groups here, for example, in Gallatin, and they're across the nation. Like, I'm just going to head back and say this in here, I think, in this environment. 
But you know, we take the Methodist folk we have here, which wonderful, wonderful folks. They've been a whole lot more involved in the social aspects of ministry and stuff. So, for example, the Baptists have oftentimes they are involved in the food banks and the cloth clothing banks and welfare programs, and so on and so forth. But the way they've gone about it is kind of like the way the government has gone about it. It just fosters more of the same because if you if you feed a person. You know, and you don't give them anything, but they'll just keep coming back like they did in John 6. But, you know, they were fed. They came back the next day to get fed again. But that day, they got a meal they wasn't counting on. You know, the, the blood and flesh <laughs> that died, but it didn't go over too good with them. So they went away. And, and I'm, I'm afraid that's kind of, you know, if you, you have got to confront people with the reality that the church is not here for a welfare program, it's here to make disciples, but when there are people that have needs, clearly love gets into action and does something about those needs. You know, one thing that Bonhoeffer speaks about is, um, uh, you know, that Christ has to be at the center of a community. The only reason that we are together as a Christian community is because of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not an affinity group, That's right. okay? Uh, and it, it's like, you know, if, if, uh, if you're called to be a pastor, the only reason you have the, uh, the privilege of standing up and speaking for God is because God has called you to do that in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You separate that relationship, and, and you shouldn't be doing it. And, um, and, and that's a lot of where he is going. Is he, says, uh, he says a church can go out, and they can do all kinds of great things. But if they're not doing what Jesus has told them to do, if they're not holding Jesus at the center, then it doesn't matter. They're just a social group who happens to be doing, uh, you know, a civic club who's doing nice things. Mm -hmm. Now that offends people uh, a lot of times, but that's that's really true. Um, you know, it, you have to be listening to Jesus and, and following specifically with Jesus, having those obedient steps. You know, what is Jesus telling you to do? 